Well, hey friends of Biblical Genetics, thank you so much for tuning in. I am Dr. Rob, coming to you today from Western Iowa. I'm in the Los Hills, just overlooking the Missouri River Valley. I was actually trying to film on an open prairie, but it's so windy and so hot and muggy today that that was out. So I came to an oak forest, nice and calm and quiet. I hear turkeys gobbling all around me. This is a really, really interesting place. Now, Los, if you don't know, is a, um, a clay-like, silty, muddy stuff that was blown into place during the Ice Age. We find massive Los deposits around the world. I think the Yellow River in China is named the Yellow River because of the sediments in the river which drain from a Los Plateau. That's an interesting question. But I know this stuff is scattered around, really fascinating, cool geology, cool history. I'm actually in a Preparation Canyon State Park, apparently during the Mormon trek out to Utah. A whole bunch of families stopped here for a little while to prepare themselves for heaven because they had a little splinter group and this guy was telling them stuff and he ended up apparently embezzling a lot of things and they chased him away with threat of hanging and some people made it to Utah and some people didn't and it's just very interesting history. But I'm not here to talk to you about geology or history. The question is, is COVID-19 evolving? Now usually when I do a video I try to tie in my background and my scenery to some little gimmicky way to get into my subject, but I have no idea how to do that in this case, so I'm just going to start talking. I have gotten this question a lot. Is COVID-19 evolving? Is it Delta variant, Delta Plus, the Lambda variant? Are these examples of evolution? Now I want to take all of the angst and just put it aside for a moment. We're not talking about masks. We're not talking about vaccinations. We're not talking about whether or not this is manufactured in a laboratory, whether it's deliberate released or not. No, those are all sideshows. Those are distractions. This is biblical genetics. So we're going to talk about a biblical application of genetics using the coronavirus. Now this virus is mutating. It absolutely is mutating. But is it evolving? That's the question. I'm going to say yes, it's mutating. No, it's not evolving. And I'm going to use other examples specifically. Darwin's finches. Mutation, natural selection, no evidence of evolution. The peppered moth. No evidence of evolution. In fact, what we know about the peppered moth today uh, changes a lot of things. In fact, the caterpillars of the peppered moth can change their coloration back based on their background that they're living on. Wow, that's interesting. I don't know about the adult moths, but there's a lot more going on than the simple old-fashioned story of natural selection that we were told. Also, the H1N1 influenza virus that I've studied extensively in my work is not evolving. In fact, it evolved to the point where it went extinct. That is, mutations accumulated until it finally couldn't compete with other H1N1s, which was a swine flu that swept the world in 2009 and 2010, and the human version, which had been circulating since the 1910s, went extinct. So mutations does not equal evolution. All examples of natural selection don't equal evolution. But this virus that we're talking about, the, 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 the virus that causes COVID-19, it is absolutely mutating. I want to bring up another idea. This is from Michael Behe, uh, intelligent design proponent, very famous. He came up with uh, um, the mousetrap idea and um, he talks about irreducible complexity. But in one of his books called The Edge of Evolution, he talks about what mutation can and cannot do, what evolution cannot wait for and can wait for. And if it's a simple change, it's probably going to happen if you have a high enough mutation rate, a large enough population, enough natural selection. And he uses the example of Plasmodium falciparum, which is the, um, the little parasite that causes malaria, one form of malaria. And he said, given enough Plasmodium and given a certain mutation rate and given enough people infected with it, you would expect to get a one letter change so many times per generation of plasmodium. Now most malaria medications were useless after just a short time because it was simple to get one letter change that could overcome that particular drug. But chloroquine, that thing that everyone's saying is useful for SARS-CoV-2, which is probably not true, but it might be, but it probably isn't. The data are still equivocal. But that medicine used for malaria needs two different mutations to overcome it. So given a probability of those mutations arising about one in 100 quintillion plasmodium and a population size of about 1,000 quintillion plasmodium, 
that would mean that that mutation, those mutations necessary to overcome chloroquine, will be occurring several times, let's say per year, maybe per generation, per decade, doesn't matter. They're going to be appearing here and there. And then if that person is exposed to that drug, the plasmodium will ignore it, keep on populating, and then maybe spread to the next person. So just because the mutation appears doesn't mean it's guaranteed it's going to spread throughout the whole population, but it does appear, it has appeared, it was possible, it should have been predicted to appear because it's an easy change. Now, when we look at the coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2, the thing that's causing COVID-19, that's all the same thing, that virus, there is a certain mutation rate. After about a year and a half in circulation, most of these viruses have about 25 single letter changes. There's a couple of deletions, a couple of insertions we've seen, usually three or six letters because that's one amino acid in the RNA. And we're seeing change happen, but these are simple and easy changes. In fact, most of the changes are the letter C changing to the letter U. That's caused by the deamination of cytosine. Cytosine has an NH2 group sticking off it and water can attack that and rip it off and now all of a sudden it's a uracil. Well, when that happens in your genome, the body says, wait a minute, uracil is not supposed to be in the genome and it'll fix it. But this virus is an RNA virus and uracil is in RNA. There's four letters of DNA, A, C, G, and T. There's four letters of RNA, A, C, G, and U. So when a C changes to a U, there's no possible error checking. And so one of the most common chemical modifications of RNA is the most common mutation that we see in this virus. So given an awful lot of virus, I don't know the population size of this virus and the number of people that have been infected, the number of transmission effects, uh, and the transmission and the number of transmission episodes that have happened, there is a lot of opportunity for a lot of different mutations to occur in the virus. And we've seen that. I can build a whole family tree of these viruses and show it to you. It is mutating over time. And every time there's a mutation, a new branch of that family tree appears. It is definitely mutating. That means that we should expect simple changes. And if a simple change can cause more infectivity, we should expect it to happen. If a simple change can cause it to become more deadly, we should expect that to happen. If a simple change can cause it to change enough that it, the, our immune system's antibodies no longer recognizes it, that would be called a breakthrough infection, and we should expect that to happen. This is all in the realm of probability. It's all in the realm of what we absolutely 100% expect. Is it evolution? No. Because just like in the H1N1 virus that we saw over, over 75 or more years, we saw the number of A's going up, the number of U's going up, the number of C's going down, the number of G's going down. We're talking about a percent, a percent and a half change over that much time. That's a lot of change. That's just random mutations accumulating. Essentially, the viral genome was randomizing. We saw the, um, the three letter codes that code for each amino acid in the protein randomizing. We saw the virus getting less and less human-like over time. Randomizing. That is not evolution. Evolution is the opposite of random. Now, not enough time has happened in the coronavirus to cause all that randomization. It's only been a year and a half. We've only got 25 or so letter changes. So not a lot, but we're already seeing that trend. The virus can't escape basic chemistry. It can't escape the second law of thermodynamics. It cannot escape genetic entropy. There are also some enzymes in the body called apobec. There's several, like, apobec 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. There's a whole bunch of different types of apobecs, and each one of them causes different types of mutations, but in particular, they degrade RNAs. So when you're infected with an RNA virus, your body throws these enzymes at it to degrade the RNA so that the next one that gets passed on is more decrepit. That might be an explanation for why there's so many C to T mutations, C to, C to U mutations, or it just might be pure chemistry. We don't know yet, but the virus is decaying, but that doesn't mean it won't become more deadly. Can you separate those two ideas in your head? Most scientists can't do this. Most people in the media can't do it. Just because it's more deadly doesn't mean it has evolved. It just means that it has figured out how to infect us better, how to spread better, how to avoid old 
uh, immune system antibodies. But that doesn't mean it's evolving. But the process of evolution is a long-term thing. It takes a very long time for it to happen. So we're going to have to sit back and wait. But from what we've seen in other viruses and what we can predict with genetic entropy and basic chemistry, we should see this thing wane over decades. Not over a year, but over decades. What this means is 95% of the human population is eventually going to develop antibodies to this virus because we've never seen it before. These antibodies don't exist in the human population. So you're either going to be vaccinated to get the antibodies or you're going to catch the coronavirus and get antibodies if you survive. Right now, death rates are around 1.8, 1.7%, but that's due to very expensive medical intervention in the Western countries, not in the, I don't want to call, I think third world is, a, is a, not a politically correct term anymore, but in the developing world, their death rates are higher than in the Western world because we have expensive medicines. I believe. Now, the statistics are there. I'm already talking about things I shouldn't because you can all jump on me with other, oh, this and that, and this person said this, and this person says that. And I, I already know I'm going to get a lot of comments that have nothing to do with what I just talked about. Uh, and I don't want to get sidetracked into the vaccine argument. I don't want to get sidetracked into the, the do masks work argument and the we're losing our freedoms argument. I just want to talk about evolution versus creation using coronavirus as a context. Thank you to all my supporters on buymeacoffee.com, Stephanie S at RS2, John H, George S and two anonymous donors this month. Buymeacoffee.com, search for biblical genetics. Over on Patreon.com, my long term, term supporters Dave H, Adam B, M, Matsky, and Rob S. You're in my top level. Middle level, Mark K, Mike from Australia, Daniel P, James R, and Jeff V, D. My lower level, Jonathan P, Paul P, and Ted H. Thank you all for your support. You are really helping me here. The encouragement, the funding, and the attaboys. Thank you for your comments. I'm looking forward to getting a lot of comments on this particular episode, but hey, gang, let's try to keep it on target. There's too many distractions. I want to talk about genetic entropy and the virus. That's the comments. Thank you for listening and be safe. This virus can be deadly. It can be debilitating. But if you want more information on is it evolving, go to creation.com and type in COVID evolving because my article will appear there right in the search results. I just wrote it. It's just coming out on creation.com right now. This is uh, middle of August 2021. It's there in the future for you who are listening or watching this later. We also have some very interesting articles. Um, one I wrote on the RNA vaccines and whether or not they work, how they work, are they you know, engineering us genetically and things like that, which is not true. Uh, Jonathan Sarfati has written a very long article about vaccines and essentially all the exceptions and, and uh, contradictions people want to throw at me have been answered in that article. Just go to creation.com, type in vaccines. My article on RNA vaccines will pop up and his article on vaccines and CMI's position that we worked very hard to develop will be there also. There are also some videos on the coronavirus and the pandemic. Um, a year and a half ago, though, listening to them now is really kind of funny because I, mean, I remember once in one of these videos said, oh, can you imagine if they had to shut down like New York City? <laughs> I had no idea. That was very early in the pandemic. Wow, we've learned a lot. I can't wait to sing, but I can't wait for this thing to be over.